There are two kinds of energy. Potential energy, which is energy of position, is the first kind we're going to talk about. We'll talk about kinetic energy in a minute. And uh, one uh, picture that I'd like to draw for you is um, yep, um, a picture of what uh, one of the equations for potential energy is. This is from physics. And you can imagine that if you have a ball on top of a cliff with a height h, that the potential energy of the ball is going to be the mass of the ball, uh, ball in kilograms times gravity. And we'll talk about that in a minute, times the height. And this equation is oftentimes uh, abbreviated MGH for mass times gravity times height. Now, uh, height has to be in meters. And gravity is a constant. And that constant is 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay, So that means that... Um, if we can plug in some numbers here, and I'm going to plug in numbers. Um, well, actually, let's take a detour here for units. So that means that potential energy is in units of kilograms times meters per second squared times meters, or a kilogram meters squared, because there's meters times meters here, divided by seconds squared. And uh, science, scientists, I guess, have defined uh, this unit where it's one kilogram meter squared per second squared. We have defined that as something called a joule to honor the scientist uh, joule who did work in energy. And what I'd like to say is, uh, just for a minute here, what is a joule, right? And I guess we can say a couple things about that. Um, so one thing is, so let's define a couple things here. So uh, one food calorie, like on the back of a Snickers bar, and there's some details about this in this week's activity, equals 1,000. scientific or science calories. And we will uh, generally use one big C cal for a food calorie and one little c cal for, oh, equals 1,000 little c cal for scientific calories. And then the next thing we have to say is that uh, one little c cal, which is one science calorie, is defined as 4.184 joules. So you can sort of see here that a food calorie has a lot of scientific calories and even more joules in them. So a joule from a food sense is a small thing. Now, let's actually plug some numbers in here for um, these. And let's see if we can get one joule. And what kind of numbers or what kind of masses and things we need in here. So, for example, we'll skip the mass for a second. We know that, that 9.8 meters per second uh, squared, there we go, is constant, that's gravity. And let's suppose we want to drop it from one meter. And we won't worry too much about sig figs here uh, or numbers that are used in this. We'll just do one meter, uh, perfect meter. Most people know what a meter is. It's about three feet, uh, a little bit more than three feet actually. And then 
if we're going to get one joule, then we have to solve for x here. We're going to divide by, well, the one we don't have to divide by, but so divide by 9.8. We get that x equals, and I've got my calculator here. One divided by 9.8 is 0 0.102. And those are gonna be kilograms. And uh, 0 0.102 turns out to be almost exactly the mass of 18 quarters. Remember coins? Well, uh, I still had a few around here. So 18 quarters in a bag is almost exactly 0 0.102 kilograms. And therefore, if I drop these from one meter, which is about the length of my arm. So let's see, it's a little, my arm's a little above the table. So we'll do it about there. And so these quarters, actually the table is 30 inches. So uh, put it a little above the table. If I were to drop this onto the floor, or it says right here, one meter above the floor, it has one joule of energy. I don't know if that helps. Uh, it's interesting to think about, but that uh, I know that helps me. So to think about what is a joule and how much energy stores, because uh, you can think about how much um, energy or what happens as it goes from one meter above the floor to the floor, to the floor there. And it makes some noise. That's a little bit about what a joule is. Um, now let's talk about kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is energy of motion. So something has to be moving to have kinetic energy. And uh, there's a lot of kinetic energy that we can talk about because there's a lot of things moving. For example, uh, specifically for um, coffee. So we're gonna be roasting coffee using hot air. And that hot air is blown, is moving, right? And using hot air that moves, that is moving. And in a very real way, that hot air is going to hit the coffee beans and give those coffee beans energy. That energy is going to heat up the coffee beans. Uh, but we'll say more about that too. Um, we're gonna talk about heating water too. So heating water. Um, so, and one of the key equations from science about uh, energy of motion and about kinetic energy is that the uh, average kinetic energy is proportional to the temperature. And how we'd write this in uh, a science class other than this is that kinetic energy, that's Ke, the bar on top means average. And please write uh, that the bar on top means average in your notes, is proportional to temperature. And T, temperature is capital T. And so uh, the hotter something is, the more kinetic energy it has because the more motion it's going to have. Now, one more thing we want to say, and that is the kinetic energy, not the average kinetic energy, but the kinetic energy of an object is equal to one half mass times volume, uh, mass, volume mass times velocity squared. So mass m equals mass, again in kilograms, v equals velocity, 
in meters per second. And so now we have uh, velocity. So if we have uh, multiply these two together, kilogram, so meter squared per second squared. So energy has the same units as uh, for kinetic energy as potential energy. Kilogram meter squared per second squared. So one joule equals a kilogram meter squared per second squared. Same type of units. So now let's plug in for one joule. Um, you know, it's a good question where the half comes from. I'll have to think about that. Um, but for now, let's say, well, we'll use it in the equation, but I, I don't have a good answer for where that comes from. But I'll use it here. So one joule equals half. And then we'll use the same 18 quarters, which is 0 0.102 kilograms. And we'll see how fast that has to be moving those 18 quarters to have the energy of one joule. So let's see, this time I'm gonna to have to, uh, well, this two is in the denominator, so I'm gonna multiply times two, and then I'm going to divide by 0 0.102 kilograms, and that way this cancels, divide by 0 0.102, that cancels, and that will allow us to get our velocity squared by itself. Let's go ahead and do the math on this. So two times one is just two, divided by 0.102. I get 19.6 equals V squared. Then we have to take the square root of both sides. And my square root button is, I have to hit shift and then square root. It was 4.4, let's go just 4.4 meters per second. And 4.4 meters per second, if you do that conversion, uh, which we won't right here, is, well, I'm just out, uh, 10 miles per hour. That is written on another page. 10 miles per hour. So if these quarters, I don't know if that was 10 miles an hour, but that was my best rendition of 10 miles an hour. Would have one joule of energy. So uh, that's a little bit. So a joule is 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 not a huge amount of energy. You're not going to do a lot of stuff with a joule. Uh, what's amazing to me from this is just how much energy is stored in food. If uh, your average everyday Snickers bar has uh, 280 food calories, that's 280,000. Uh, let's see this. So Snickers bar has 280 food calories. That's why I'm using the capital. That's equal to 280,000 scientific calories. That's why I use the lowercase there. And then one scientific calorie equals 4.184 joules which means that now we multiply this out, 280,000 times 4.184, that is over a million joules in one Snickers bar. And so I'm gonna try and write this in scientific notation, one, two, three, four, five, six. So let's go for 1.2 times 10 to the sixth joules in one Snickers bar. So my, my thought is there's a lot of energy in food. That's what helps keep us as warm-blooded animals alive, all that energy, which is pretty cool. Now, one of the things we're gonna be talking about in this week's activity is the energy of heating water. Let me show you uh, uh, or describe a little bit about that process. So, uh, and you can imagine that you've got a hot plate, and on top of that hot plate, and it's touching it. So I'll just, there we go, it's touching it. This might be the worst kettle. 
I've ever seen, but there's the spout. There's the handle. Yeah. And that's a kettle on a hot plate. And it's filled with water. And here's what happens when you turn on your hot plate. When you turn on your hot plate, your hot plate gets hot. So that'll be getting hot. And your hot plate surface is a solid. Hot plate surface is a solid. And we said too that then, and let me write this up in the corner here. So uh, kinetic energy average is proportional to temperature. And so as something gets hotter, it has more kinetic energy. If something is to a higher temperature, it has more kinetic energy. Now, if you're a solid, that means that on the hot plate surface, that all of the particles are stuck in place. So the kind of kinetic energy that a solid has is vibrations. So hot plate surface is a solid. Each solid particle has vibrations. Come on back. Each solid particle has vibrations. If you're at a higher temperature, so high temperature particles in the solid phase, here I can put that up, high temperature solid particles, low temperature solid particles, but they're still stuck in place. They're not moving, they're stuck in place. Solid particle has vibrations, higher temperature, and I'll write higher T equals uh, more vibrations or bigger vibrations. There we go. Then the hot plate touches the kettle. So that's one and two. So if this is the hot plate and on top of it is the kettle, so all of a sudden it's vibrating and it bumps, bumps into the kettle particles and gives the kettle, kettle particles, the parts of the kettle, which is also a solid, a, it gives it some of that kinetic energy because the kettle, or sorry, the hot plate is moving very quickly. The kettle is at room temperature, so it's moving more slowly. Let's see, bump, bump, bump. And now all of a sudden, the kettle is warmed up because it is taking some of that vibrations. So hot plate, uh, particles. We won't say what they are. It doesn't matter. Bump into kettle particles and give the kettle some kinetic energy, which raises the kettle's temperature. Bump in the kettle particles, which gives kettle particles. some kinetic energy, Ke, which raises the temperature. Of kettle. And then in the same way, the kettle is now vibrating faster because it's warmed up. It bumps into the water particles that are in the kettle and the kettle and the water particles move up. Uh, so uh, kettle particles. And the kettle is typically made out of metal. Metal conducts uh, um, heat and electricity, but here heat conducts heat well. So as soon as the bottom kettle particle gets vibrating, it moves the one above it, which moves the one above it, which moves the one above it. Bam, you're hitting the water. Um, kettle particles bump into water. Which gives water kinetic energy and raises its temperature. Gives water kinetic energy and a higher temperature. 
And so in a very physical way, you literally have the hot plate getting hot. It bumps into the kettle. The kettle gets hot. The kettle bumps into the water particles. The water particles get hot. And the water particles are liquid. I'm going to put four over here. Water is liquid. Now, in addition to vibrations, the water particles can move. So the water particles move. Uh, so, and therefore, the water particles that are warm down at the very bottom move, which allows the colder air water particles to come down and get heated up as well. And so now that the water particles can move, you start to have convection currents. of moving water particles. So the hot particles go up, the cold particles go down, cold particles bump in, and all of a sudden you've got um, that water particle is hot too. And so you'll get these currents in here that allow all of the water to reach essentially the same temperature or the same temperature, and then it boils, then it starts turning into a gas. Once it turns into a gas, because it's got that much kinetic energy, and if enough of it does, you get the whistle if yours is a whistling kettle. Um, and what I like to think of is whenever something heats up, it's a giant conga line of you bump into me, I bump into the next person, that person bumps into the next person, for heat transfer. Now, uh, let's take a slightly different approach. Now we're gonna be interested in something called the specific heat capacity of water. That is this number right here, 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. That number says that for every one gram, of water to be raised one degree Celsius four point one eight four joules must be added to the water. And that's going to give us an equation that we will use that energy. Uh, and this is going to be the energy in joules needed to heat water. And I'm just going to use J for joules now. J is capital J needed to heat water. Is going to equal the mass of water. times the specific heat capacity of water and this is all one thing so I'm going to make the parentheses a little bigger so it fits times the temperature change temperature change and I probably maybe I don't have to say this but of course it has to be the temperature change of water as well and we'll see that this is, equation is abbreviated. Energy equals mass of water, sub water, times the specific heat capacity of water, which is C sub S, specific heat capacity, C is heat capacity, of water, times delta T, where delta means change, and delta T is T final minus T initial, which we will again abbreviate T final minus T initial. And in science, it is always T final minus T initial. Whatever the final state is, it's always final minus initial. That's a convention. Um, there may be exceptions, but the vast majority are final minus initial. So now let's plug in and find out how much energy it takes for this. You have 25.0 grams of water. 
And grams are okay this time because our units on this are in grams. I heart units. Please write I heart units somewhere on this page. Oh, or you can write bill heart units if you want, if you don't personally. But if you do heart units, you can write that as well. But bill heart units for sure. Uh, joules per gram degree Celsius. And then our temperature change here is going from 22.4 to 90. So our 90.0 degrees Celsius will be our final temperature, minus 22.4 degrees Celsius, which is our initial temperature. And then we can multiply all this out. I'm going to do the temperature change first, since that's a subtraction. I get 90 minus 22.4. 67.6 degrees. And then I'm going to do that times 4.184. And that's going to be times 25. And I get 7,070.96, which I'm just going to round to E equals 70.71. And these are joules because my grams cancel. That's grams in the denominator grams in the numerator, degrees Celsius in the denominator, degrees Celsius in the numerator.